Welcome to the Make It Happen podcast. My name is Melanie Moreno. I am a blogger, a content creator, a health coach, and most importantly, I will be your host. Join me for some fun and inspiring conversations with amazing individuals coming up now. Because of how I viewed myself, it's always like, no, like I have to rely on somebody else because somebody else's words would be more important or more credible than my own, right? So getting to a place where I'm just like, oh, wait, like I can say stuff too. And it's like cool if I say stuff because it's okay if I only have something to say. I don't need somebody else to like corroborate it or anything like that. I should just talk. Yeah, I'm getting it. I'm like working my way to it. It's so funny to hear as you said that. I was like, I feel that way, but I'm, well, okay, I don't want to be insulted towards myself. I was going to say, but I'm nobody. Um, <laughs> well, Good, I'm like, glad you caught that. I'm yeah, glad I, you- I don't mean I'm, I'm nobody, but you're a licensed professional. And, and then here you are saying, you know, you're not sure about the platform you have to speak on. Having a title isn't everything, but mm-hmm. I'm I'm still trying to recondition that myself. Um, but a lot of us tend to think of titles as meaning something, and then yeah, here you are with you know your own professional practice, and and you still feel that way. So it like it knows no bounds that sort mm-hmm. of insecurity. Oh hell yeah. Hello and welcome to the Make It Happen podcast. Mm-hmm. I hope you enjoyed that little snippet of my conversation with Andrea. That is actually a little clip of conversation that we had outside of filming the podcast or recording the podcast, I should say. And I just thought it was a really interesting moment to share. I have a lot of limiting beliefs of my own and I wanted to call myself out on that so there I am showing you guys that you know I have these insecurities myself and the negative self-talk is a real thing and it's something that we all need to work on it's an everyday thing to battle so today we have one of my favorite people in the world Andrea Bessa she is a licensed psychotherapist. She deals with somatic experiencing. She is based in Canada, so she's extra cool. Um, I met her on Instagram, actually, after, well, in the episode, we briefly mentioned how both of us were into cycle syncing, and that's how we connected. And cycle syncing is basically a practice based off of the teachings of Elisa Vitti in the book called Woman Code. And you can go check that out a little bit more if you're intrigued. So that's how we initially connected. Since then, both of us have expanded into just totally different pathways. And I'm really excited about everything Andrea's been working on with her practice. And she offers so many helpful strategies and tips in this episode. She is a beautiful human being. I hope you guys love this conversation I had with her. And if there's anything valuable that you get out of this episode, perhaps share it with a friend. That's only going to help this podcast get to the ears of people who can benefit from it. Thank you for listening. Share the episode. Yeah, so let's get straight into this beautiful conversation with Andrea Bessa. First, let me say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming onto my podcast. I'm thoroughly thrilled to chat with you because I have been a longtime admirer of your Instagram and just the things you say. I feel like like each time I read your post, I feel like, man, this girl has it all together. She <laughs> she has her message so on point. And the fact that you're a therapist now, I feel like anyone who's working with you is just 
in such good hands. Wow, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm. So yes, I'm. I'm trying to like be composed here, but I'm very excited to speak. Yeah, same. Let me just ask you to introduce yourself. Tell the listeners a little bit about you. Oh man, well, I am just your regular human. Um, like you said, I'm a therapist. Um, I live in Lynn, Ontario because Canadians aren't very original in naming their cities. <laughs> yeah, I just, I work for a private practice. I have my own, um, I'm married. I have a partner, um, his name's Jonathan. Uh, I'm trying to think I have a dog who is my whole entire world. And yeah, like there's not, there's not a ton to me right now that I can like think off the top of my head. Like. It's kind of, I'm trying to think of like what my days consist of. And I basically, it's like a combination of a lot of self-care because of the work I do and setting a lot of boundaries and just prioritizing a lot of like social connection that is very helpful for me in terms of being able to, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some of the things that I'm kind of um, spending more time doing now since, you know, school's over and I can kind of fill my days um, anyway, like now, I'm just doing a lot of work around trauma and like things like that. So, like a lot of like, um, I mean, I I I am uh, somatic experiencing reading and research. Um, yeah, I like doing my own reading and research on um, developmental trauma and like even like car accidents and things like that. Trying to get my hands on like a ton of strategies that incorporate the body just to make sure that I'm like on the up and up with my work that it benefits me personally and professionally. So it's just kind of like, I like to nerd out with that kind of stuff right now. <laughs> so yeah. So cool. Okay. Let's dive into, I like starting at the beginning. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing. What was little Andrea like? Where'd she live? Like, let's get into that. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so funny enough, so I grew up in a very conservative religious home, but at the same time, it wasn't, I don't think I would call it like super suffocating or anything like that. It was just, that was just the structure I was given. So I went to, um, a private Christian school for elementary school, high school, and actually university. Um, so I grew up in Oshawa, Ontario, um, also known as the dirty schwa, so it's not very nice over there, but, um, but yeah, so that's where I grew up. I was actually born in Toronto, so I actually lived there until about age six, and then we moved to Oshawa. Uh, I have a younger sister. Uh, she's four years younger than me, um, so life just kind of consisted of, we didn't have a lot of, like, family in the area, so it was very much, like, just me and my sister and my parents, like, kind of like us against the world type of thing. My dad was a stay-at-home dad because he has an autoimmune disorder called Bichette's. So um, he used to work at Sony, and he was actually very successful. He was one of their, like, top accountants, but then he got sick um, and lost. He was completely blind for a time, and then he was able, he was able to regain um, eyesight in one of his eyes. And so with that, he wasn't – he had to go on long-term disability, and so he kind of was just, like – uh, doing the whole dad thing up until like now, to be honest. I mean, we're all gone. So he's, my parents are empty nesters. So they're kind of just living their life now and stuff. So, which is nice. But yeah, so <laughs> I spent a lot of, lot of time with my dad, um, even as like a little baby, my sister too. But it was a little bit different with me just because he got sick when I, like around the time that I was born. So Although I like I don't have any recollection of it, it was more of us trying to figure out how to do life with this new change with my dad. Whereas when my sister came on the scene, we already had like our life together, so it wasn't as like like fumbling around trying to figure out like our new normal with my dad's um, eyesight or loss of eyesight. So yeah, that was so yeah. I don't know what else to talk about with that. We spent all of our summers up in Muskoka, which is like cottage country here in Ontario. Um, my mom worked for like the Christian summer camp. She was their administrative assistant. So, 
um, by association, we got to spend our summers there. So I spent every single summer there since the age of eight until, oh man, until I graduated from university. So a lot of summers, a lot of horseback riding, a lot of water skiing, that kind of thing, but nothing too special. <laughs> you mentioned your father has bichettes, is that what it's called? Yeah. Can, can you describe a little bit more of what that is? It's immune disorder. Um, but it's actually pretty common in Portuguese people. They're like super, he actually like lived in Portugal for a year. My, all of my grandparents live in Portugal. Um, so he actually just went back home to Portugal and stayed there for a year and they were able to kind of help him out. Um, just because the like Canadian doctors weren't super familiar with it. So, um, he was just kind of out of luck in that, in that regard. So Um, He had to go away for a little while. And then my mom and I met up with him later on. And then we were able to stay for like the rest of his treatment and then all come back together. Um, So like I said, it was a little bit, it was a kind of like, it was a little bit tough, like trying to figure out life post um, diagnosis and stuff. So yeah, so when my sister came around, all that stuff, it was over and we were just living life. So it was a little bit different. So yeah, and my sister and I don't have it and we're probably not going to get it either. How do you feel that affected your family dynamic or even you personally growing up, you know, with your father's health and that condition? Oh, yeah. It was, it definitely was traumatic in the sense of like leaving my mom uh, with a new baby, my dad not being around. And also for me too, just being a baby and not understanding why he left. Because, like I said, like um, at the time, maternity leave in Canada was only six months. Now it's um, 18, um, 18 months. But at the time, it was only six. So she only stayed with me for six months, and then she had to go back to work. So after that, it was me and him all the time, like constantly. Um, so I, I obviously had bonded a lot with him. Uh, so when he left, like even though I was a baby, I, it, it definitely affected, um, de- definitely affected me. I'm actually like been doing a lot of work around that kind of stuff now as an adult, just because I have more clarity as to what that kind of separation could have done to me in terms of like attachment. But after we came, after we joined him in Portugal, it, things got a lot easier just because we had my grandparents support in terms of helping to take care of me. And then my mom being able to help my dad or be there for my dad because she didn't have to worry about taking care of me. So being able to go to Portugal and be with him was like a huge, it was like a a very impactful and beneficial for our family unit in that, in that we were able to kind of figure out our groove. And then when we came back to Canada, things kind of got a little bit easier. So, so yeah, it was like, it was pretty tough at first. Um, My mom has shared with me, like she had some like, uh, like depression then too having to like go through that and like kind of seeing her husband that like her husband go through that, not being able to help him in the way that she wanted to, like, it was really tough. But like I said, going back to Portugal just made like a huge difference. So yeah. Did the caretaking experience that you had growing up with your father happen to influence the decision to go into therapy as a career? Oh, um, to be honest, no. (laughs) Um, I did my undergrad in speech language pathology. Um, I had a close family friend who had, he had like an aneurysm. And so that was like one of the main things I was like, really, really, um, didn't know if we would ever be able to talk to him again, or if he would ever be able to talk to us. So then I did some research. This is all in like grade 10, mind you. And I was like, Oh, I totally want to do speech path because like, that's super cool. When I actually got into university, um, I realized it wasn't really for me, but I finished up the program anyway. And then, you know, life happens. And a few years later, I was like, you know what, I actually hate this. So <laughs> I'm going to do what I actually want to do. So it it was good for me in the sense that it gave me an undergraduate degree. And it ultimately gave me the ability to get into my master's program. Um, but other than that, yeah, it, it was more of like a personal choice what led me to get into counseling. Because it's something that I always that I always enjoyed in the sense of like being able to help other humans and help them find better ways to do life, whatever that looked like. So to be able to do it for a living was just like a huge game changer for me. 
like I like more like it sounds so it sounds so silly and like kind of cliche but I really do love going to work now and that's something I never experienced in any of like my speech programs and so yeah (laughs) in a very roundabout way no but um it's kind of just interesting now to know what I know and see and see that whole part of my life and his diagnosis in a whole like different light yeah but one did not lead to the other what was the connection between those two initially studying speech language pathology and then jumping into psychotherapy how did that happen um so speech language pathology was just what I thought I wanted to do since grade 10 and I felt a lot of guilt in the sense that I didn't want to change midway through my university program because I felt like I had to stick it out to the end I so after I finished university um I went to Portugal for a year and through my time there and then um even after I got back from Portugal um I realized I didn't want to do it But I still pursued um, a grad certificate in communicative disorders assistant, which is essentially just a speech pathology assistant. Um, So I would just do the therapy without having to do the paperwork. Anyway, so I started that grad certificate um, and I realized like I really, really hated speech pathology, (laughs) Um, which just made me even more like even As I worked with the kids and even an adult, I realized I was more interested in like who they were as people as opposed to just working with their uh, speech. So I just continued pursuing my master's instead and I didn't finish my grad certificate because I was coming home crying every single day and super not loving, like hating having to go to work every single day. Um... So it just wasn't worth it for me. So I just, I just quit. I was able to just like let it go and not take away, like let it take away from like who I was as a person, um, which was very, very nice to be honest. It was something that had like, it was like a long time coming to be honest. So my master's degree in counseling psychology, um, I just really wanted to be with people and that program gave me the ability to do that. So yeah, it was always just people. People were always just my motivator. Ever since like a very young age, I just loved people. People were just my thing. Um, so I, by letting go of my communicative disorders assistant program and giving myself permission to just pursue this was really give myself the opportunity to just be with people. How cool. I'm actually really curious to hear what a session with you would be like. For someone who's never been to therapy, can you paint a picture of what it's like to meet with a therapist or meet with you in particular? Oh, yeah. So there's no one size fits all to therapy. I am a firm believer of that. Like I have like I have a full caseload right now and I like the things that I do with every single person There's like underlying similar themes in terms of what interventions I use, but how they're applied are very unique to every single individual. Like no one therapy session looks the same, sounds the same. And I like, I like entering sessions with no expectations, but to simply listen and and attune to the client to, to whatever they have happening for them right now. Um, A lot of what I ask though has a lot to do with the body um, because I work from that somatic experiencing lens. So essentially what that's called is bottom up. So I work from the body and then to like the narrative story, that kind of thing, but which I do feel is super important as well. However, that being said, you know, no one size fits all. Sometimes people aren't able to get into their body as easily as maybe another client. So I may, I may have to go top down. Um, however, the body will be incorporated in some way at some point because it like the like therapy needs to be holistic. It needs to include the body. Um, mind body connection. It's not really a thing in that it's really just mind body. They're just so in, intricately uh, connected that you need like you need to just address both and not separate them as two separate as two things. 
they need to just be seen as one. So that's why somatic experiencing and knowing about the body and the nervous system and also knowing thoughts and all of those things are, are addressing the story is still so important too, because they inform each other. So there's no point in isolating because you always need both. I don't know if that makes sense, but (laughs) essentially that. (laughs) Okay. Tell me if I have this correct. It sounds like somatic experiencing is about getting people in touch with their bodies. So as then to access the thoughts that are affecting them? Um, So somatic experiencing in of itself is uh, an approach to uh, resolving trauma. So it's not self-regulation, although self-regulation is obviously incorporated into it, but it is specifically used to resolve trauma in the body. So if you can think of like um, a wild animal, like an antelope or something like that, um, and a predator comes, uh, its first instinct is to flee. So just like people, the flight response come on, comes online when they sense threat and they take off, uh, just like humans. It's always flight first, then fight, and then freeze. It's the, it's the same thing in humans as it is in animals. So when, uh, so knowing that, um, somatic experiencing just works to resolve the trauma with that information, with that nervous system information. And trauma can be anything. So trauma, simply put, um, it doesn't have to be like a car accident or like a rape. Like it doesn't ha- trauma encompasses so much more than that. Um, trauma is when a boundary is broken without permission, whatever that may look like. And it's super important to be addressed in therapy. And it's why sometimes a lot of top down interventions aren't, they don't, they're not long term solutions because they don't incorporate the body, um, which somatic experiencing does. Um, so a kind of, we, we go in and we do a lot of resourcing, which is essentially finding things that feel good in the body and kind of making it a titrated process so that there's no re-traumatization as we work to resolve the the incomplete threat, threat response in the body. Is this a practice that someone can do outside of a therapy session? Perhaps how could someone tell if they have some unresolved trauma lodged somewhere in their body? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so in, in the sense of like, I, I don't know, like every case is individual. To, so to say like, oh, you have trauma, that was a traumatic thing. Like it depends, right? Um, it depends on a lot of things, whether a certain situation uh, created a traumatic response in the body or not. So with that being said, like somatic experiencing, there people have to be certified for that. Um, so, to, so to say like, oh, you can do somatic experiencing on yourself, um, you can do more like self-regulation parts of it on your own, but even as like a, a somatic experiencing practitioner, um, through our training, we actually have to do personal sessions to work through any personal traumas that we have, and we work with another somatic experiencing practitioner, like a more experienced one. So we're even working through our own stuff throughout our training. Um, because we can't do it on our own. We do have to work with someone else. So it, I would, I would imagine it would be the same thing with like, not imagine, I know it's the same thing with, with clients, like for people who feel that they need to resolve something, I would highly recommend working with someone who is a professional in that area, whether it's a somatic experiencing practitioner or not, just someone who understands trauma and how to work through that and create and can create a safe place for them to work through like said trauma yeah I totally understand and respect that it sounds like even the training that you went through it was a process not something that can be learned overnight so let's say there's someone listening who has never thought about this mind and body connection what's a way for them to start to tune into that what's a tool for their tool belt, essentially, so that they can have an alternative way to handle experiences that are stressful or triggering. Mm-hmm. So I've had um, 
this explained like a, like a, in a few different ways, and I've heard it from a bunch of people. So it's not by any means original, but something that I like to teach my clients is just to notice the sensations in their body, um, to get used to what that feels like, just to like increase self awareness and body awareness. So, like for example, when you're doing something you really really love, um, how does that feel in your body? Like how do you know that that feels good? Uh, some clients have said it makes me feel all warm, like I feel excitement. So how does excitement feel in your body? Is it tingly? Is it like butterflies? Like it could be anything, right? There's no wrong answer to it. So I just encourage noticing what feels good and then what feels uncomfortable. Like how do you notice discomfort? And are you willing to kind of stay with this, the discomfort as opposed to pushing it away or trying to like self-soothe in some other way, right? So like anger, can you stay with your anger? And I teach some ways to kind of work through that in therapy as well. Anger is like one of my favorite things to work with, actually. Um, Why is that? Well, it's but like, I think like, because like as a woman um, or as women, we've been taught that, you, you know, we hear that we hear the narrative, you know, you need to be a good girl, right? Whenever, you know, we start to act out or God forbid, we start being emotional and she's like need to be a good girl so that's telling a woman to be a good girl is literally telling them to inhibit their emotional experience whether it is like super excited and just like dramatic and like silly like like a little kid it's like no you need to be like prim and proper and you know polite and you know um cross your legs and keep your hands neatly on top of your legs and things like that you know just that cutesy kind of put together like very controlled thing. Right. And I hate that. <laughs> and so um, it's a lot of work that I've, had, I've even had to do personally, just like the whole idea that women need to inhibit their emotional experience. So, um, so as we get older, feeling big emotions like anger, um, it, it's really hard and it's scary. And we tend to push it away. Like we're not supposed to be angry whether we logically know that in our head that we, we shouldn't do it, it's just that we've been conditioned that anytime we had a very big emotional response, it was always associated with a punishment or like, and not necessarily that we got spanked, but just like we were told not to do that. Now it's just, it's become something that I really like to work with because I want to change that. You know, I want, I want more women, even men too. Um, to know that it's it's okay to be angry and there's a way to validate aggression in a healthy way, right? Because aggression only becomes unhealthy when you start hurting other people. So when you start bulldozing people because you're angry, it doesn't mean that your anger is invalid. It's you're acting out on it incorrectly. <laughs> so, but there's a way to do it where you don't hurt anyone. You can still feel like your anger is val validated and um, that it should be there, right? Because we should be angry. It's kind of, it's like the yin and yang of life. Like we need to be caring forces to ourselves. It's how we don't become doormats in life, right? So part of that is recognizing that one, it's okay to be angry. And two, that there's a way to validate said anger and act out on it in a way that doesn't just, you know, burn the whole entire house down, right? Metaphorical house down. So yeah, so sensations is always the first thing. Um, just noticing what good feels like, what discomfort feels like, things like that. How do you know you feel safe? How do you know you feel unsafe? Um, so if you notice your sensations first, then you can kind of, you know, label emotions if you feel like you need to, and then go to the narrative, right? And when these sensations come up, what, what emotion is it? Okay, well, you know, I'm starting to feel this pit in my stomach. So I'm feeling shame or I'm feeling guilt you know, okay, so what's the story with that? Oh, it's, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? So kind of just using it as like a three-step process, but always uh, noticing your sensations first or just tuning in and seeing how much you can tolerate and things like that, right? So like, for example, like I was saying before with the anger, um, it's so funny, yesterday we we, um, we got out of the airport and we were waiting for our shuttle to go get our rental car. And I was getting a little impatient um, <laughs> because they said they were going to be there at a certain time and they hadn't. So it, like, I was just like dying to get to where we were staying. Cause I was super tired from the plane and I wanted to shower and all this stuff. So just like 
like that end of trip agitation. And I had to go over to my partner and I was like, I just need your arm for a second. And I was able to kind of place my anger there. So I noticed what those sensation sensations were. Like I knew that I was getting like snippy and I was like starting to breathe a little bit heavy. And so I've been able to, to get to a place where I've kind of noticed when my anger starts to escalate and, um, and being able to catch it in that moment. Right. But it's a practice like I don't always catch it. And sometimes I do get really, really upset and fly off the handle or whatever it is. I just offer myself a lot of self-compassion after said instances and do a lot of repair um, with anybody who got the brunt of that. But it was but, you know, yesterday I was able to kind of notice, OK, I'm starting to get really angry and then kind of implement um, like a strategy in order to let myself. Um, know that it's okay to be angry like you know by noticing what happened in my emotional experience I or my you know body experience um, with anger I was able to validate that anger and say to myself yeah like it's okay for me to be mad about this because you know a business should respect their clients time and things like that Um, but I knew that like yelling at them wouldn't be helpful and it would just make me feel worse after so knowing those techniques and noticing my body or no, noticing my body and then being able to implement those te- techniques to validate my anger. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So I just like to um, share with those kinds of things with my clients um, and being able to um, begin that practice with them so, and being able to validate them um, in that way be, instead of getting caught up in the story. Right. So, yeah, I think that answers your question, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, that was a great explanation and example. I really like that you broke it down into a three-step process, which was essentially noticing sensations, what are the emotions tied to them, and then what's the story behind it all. That sounds simple and easy enough to remember as a technique for checking in with yourself. So... You said earlier that therapy sessions are each unique to the client and their needs, but are there any reoccurring themes that come up? Like one thing that you notice that people tend to struggle with a lot. Um, there's a lot of a lot of what I have been working with has been anxiety, guilt, and shame. And like it, it's it's been interesting because I've had a lot of um, clients coming in with, with unfaithful spouses and they're trying to figure out, you know, what life is like now, um, and how to, you know, repair that relationship. Um, I don't work with couples specifically. Um, I just do individual counseling right now, but a lot of these couples end up doing individual counseling and then couples counseling. Um, and so I've just recently had like a, um, an interesting little influx of individuals who are just struggling with that and and then I have other clients who are just the same things except it not not in that context right so um so just a lot of anxiety like anxiety is definitely like a huge one um in, in a chronic sense and then guilt and shame like a lot of it uh, is coming up as I'm sure would be the case for a lot of therapists in this day and age but um it's just been what's been coming up uh, for me a lot. Like even clients who are dealing with grief, there's guilt and shame all over those situations as well. So um, <laughs> we, we've got some guilt here. So it's it's been fun, actually, to, to see. <laughs> In this day and age, there is certainly a lot of anxiety-inducing media and stimuli that can influence that from a comparison standpoint. But what do you think is the reason for the large amount of clients who are coming to you with guilt and shame that needs addressing? Just pushes us to endure our situations as opposed to honoring our pleasure process, you know, we have a lot of sensations that that come up and then we have a certain desire and then we work to satisfy 
that desire, right? And I don't, and it's not even in like a sexual kind of way. It's literally like, you know, like this is like a silly example, but when we have an itch, you know, our desire is to scratch it because we know that'll feel really good and the itch will go away. So that is like, that's, that's a pleasure process, you know, and we don't live in a society that lets us honor that. So whether that's like in our working conditions, you know, wanting to make more money or to set up our own schedule or just to like be more in line with who we are as people so that we can live more fully in the world. You know, that's not, that's not readily available to us. Not, not all the time. It's not the mainstream, right? We're more focused on enduring, like having to do a nine five as opposed to being able to work like, um, when we feel the most productive and give, being given the autonomy um, to to live or to to be productive in a way that suits us best, right? What if you work best at five o'clock in the morning until two p.m., right? Like it, it shouldn't matter, right? So, um, so when we're always we're always enduring, like not being able to um, uphold certain boundaries or feeling like we can't put in certain boundaries in certain areas, you know, um, it's hard and we get riddled with guilt and then there's shame for needing, um, mental health days or for, you know, saying like, Hey, my kid is sick. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to work from home today, you know, feeling bad about those kinds of things. Right. So, um, there's a, so enduring our life, <laughs> our, like our life experiences as opposed to, uh, prioritizing or in, engaging in more experiences that honor our pleasure process, you know, it's tough and we get riddled with, with guilt and shame. And then we have anxiety, you know, I, like there's clients that, you know, um, because of how they were brought up, like going to work is hard because it's like <laughs> bosses and supervisors become the embodiment of their parents. So, um, so it's, it's, it's all of those kinds of things. And I, but bottom line, it's not being able to honor our pleasure process. That's kind of like my very, you know, small way of kind of clumping everything together. I mean, there is a lot of gray in this, but you know, for the most part, I really think it kind of falls this way. <laughs> So how can we tap back into this pleasure process? Personally, I feel like society can create this pressure that we all just go around carrying and transferring to one another. It's like we walk around with these predetermined ideas of what's okay and what's not okay. Only thinking of what should take priority, but not necessarily what we want to take priority. And living in, you know, rigid schedules even, just because that's the way things have always been done traditionally. So given all the barriers that we have and the resistance, how how can we overcome this and tap back into this natural pleasure center that exists in all of us? Yeah, no, to be honest, like, the more we, the more we tend to do we're just like well this is what we have to do why am I going to notice you just kind of like go through life that way as opposed to taking the time to notice like wait how does this actually make me feel in my body do I actually really love this or do I actually really hate this and um it, it's so surprising what comes up when you actually take time to notice you know they're so like like how we spend time with our families and people that we love, like making them embodied experiences so that we can draw on them when we need them. You know, when we, cause you know, um, there are going to be times in life where we do have to endure. I totally understand that. And because our nervous systems are so powerful, it's almost like we can actually relive them. Like we can bring up almost the exact sens sensations from, um, from those times and, and have them come up in the current moment. It's, it's amazing. Right. Um, so when we start going through life in a more embodied way, that's when we can start, that's when, you know, we'll start noticing and 
feeling more empowered to to honor our pleasure processes um and then it just starts making its way up through you know um through management and i think the more people get into with their nervous systems the more like bosses and supervisors and companies and businesses businesses will start having their eyes open myself the opportunity to honor my pleasure process i have now greater capacity to allow somebody else or to, to be compassionate or more open to someone else saying like, Hey, this is what I need. And it's just like, well, yeah, of course, take what you need because I take what I, what I need and you should take what you need just like I should. Right. It's like we become um, more compassionate to our common humanity. Right. And which in, which in turn brings in more kindness. Right. And, um, and there's no judgment and we become more appreciative of autonomy because we know that, because we've given someone else autonomy, that doesn't mean that it takes away from our own. We we just have we have as much right to to exercise our autonomy as somebody else, you know. Um, but that that has to start in the body. So in order for things to change, in terms of being able to honor, in order to honor our pleasure processes, it just has to start with the body. And the more people who start doing that, then that moves up the ranks. And then we will have more uh, businesses that are appreciative and open to honoring said processes. And then that's when we're all going to start feeling a lot better. <laughs> I honestly believe that. So It sounds like it's based, like many things, it's kind of based in the ripple effect of just oh, yeah. getting people to become aware, a self-advocate. And then that mm-hmm. encourages other people to do the same. Mm-hmm. And that's how this unaddressed issue gets some notice. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just like, that's the, well, that's the whole thing, right? Especially with like self-compassion and stuff, which is another lens that I work heavily from, where it's just the more you, more self-compassion you offer yourself, the more you honor your own pleasure processes, the greater capacity you have to offer it to others. Um, um, you realize like we all deserve that kind of thing. So by allowing someone else to honor their p- pleasure process, by offering someone else compassion, it doesn't take away from your own, right? I deserve it just as much as, you know, my neighbor and and vice versa, right? So when you realize that we all deserve it, then it becomes like a big thing. That's really interesting. I feel like we have a scarcity mindset. Oh, yeah. There's even that phrase about how you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. I think there's this idea that a give and take has to happen. Like if other people have something and they want to take from you or you have to develop yourself before you can fully give to others. Uh, Like, what do you think about that? Like how the individual needs to develop to interact with society. Mm -hmm. Just give me one second. I just have to move locations. Okay. Um, I just believe that people forget that, you know, like, um, forget our common humanity, right? That one doesn't take away from the other. It's the same thing in relationships. You know, we have this narrative that we shouldn't be high maintenance, that being high maintenance is wrong or it's bad, or you shouldn't be needy and like all of these things. When in reality, um, there's so much, there's so much gray in relationships. One relationship um, and how it works is different from another. Like I always give this example, like if, a, yeah, if one partner comes home and they say, you know what, every time I come home, I want my partner to come to the door, give me a hug and a kiss and to walk me to the kitchen. And then, you know, we share a meal, right? That's okay. Because the other partner can say, well, every time I come home, I want you to greet me, give me a hug and a kiss. And we're going to go sit on the couch and have a bowl of popcorn together. I want that every time I come home. They're allowed to do that. No one can say that that's wrong or bad or you shouldn't do that kind of thing because it's not, 
It's not anybody else's relationship, but theirs. They're high maintenance in their own way, right? It's the same thing in how we do life. Just because, you know, let's say you're a boss and you're and your employees want a certain amount of health days in a year. That doesn't mean that you don't get any. You are just as entitled to mental health days as your employees are because you are a human, right? It's it's rem- it's remembering that we have common humanity and that we have we um it's okay to need different things or to need things in general because everyone needs something, right? And it's okay to have those needs and to ask if they can be met or if compromises can be put in place, right? Um, in order to have a need met in some kind of way that feels good for both parties or as many parties as possible, you know? For you personally, what has been the biggest challenge that you've had to face? And also, what has been your biggest accomplishment? I think my biggest challenge has just been kind of sorting through my identity in the sense that like, um, you know, growing up in, you know, a religious household and then going to, you know, a religious school all my life, you kind of believe you have to be a certain way in order to be accepted. And now I'm in a place where I've kind of like my biggest challenge has been working through that. Because again, like because of, you know, developmental conditioning and things like that, um, it makes it a little bit more challenging because you feel like you're a bad person and all these things when your innate worth, it has always been separate from um, your performance in life, whether you're wildly successful or wildly unsuccessful, your, your worth does not change. So my biggest challenge has been working through self-imposed identity characteristics and even what I began to believe that other people, what other people thought I was. So kind of working through those beliefs, limiting beliefs more specifically, and being, and kind of questioning why they still, that, why that had to be a thing. So that, that's been very, very hard for me um, to work through. Um, it's taken me a lot of therapy, actually continued therapy, um, in order to keep calling that out for myself. Um, because it's tough. It's, it's, it's like 28 years or I guess more like 27 years of, of stuff (laughs) of being one way and feeling like I had to be a certain way when in reality I didn't, I could, I have so much room to be anything that I want. Right. And, and, and my voice matters. Um, so that's been, that's been hard. (laughs) If I may ask, how did you even begin to notice that you were holding these self-imposed beliefs or embodying the beliefs of others? How did you discover that? Actually, through, uh, through my somatic experiencing work, that's when I started working with my current therapist um, because she's a, somatic, uh, she's a somatic experiencing practitioner. And um, I realized that... Um, my body like held a lot of incomplete threat responses in regards to like who I was as a person. (laughs) And, um, I had to kind of give myself permission to question, be like, wait, why does that have to be true? Or who told me that this was true? And does it need to be true still? Do I even want it to be? Was it ever something that felt true for me? Or did I feel like I have, I had to be that way because if I didn't, I would get in trouble or I was bad and things like that, you know? So I had to do a lot of questioning, like who said that needed to be true or who said that was me. So in that, I had, in that, and, and with that, it was a lot of boundary work too, being like, no, I don't need to accept that. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't feel good or doesn't feel, doesn't align with who I think I am or who I know I am or who I want to be. You know, so I, so I gave myself permission to question and it, I'm still questioning a lot of stuff because, you know, um, I don't think this work ever ends, you know, you're always gonna, you're always gonna care about what people think, but the impact of that becomes less and less, but it still impacts in some way. So it's work that I, that I just continue to do. So yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> So once you start discovering these things, how do you then 
set barriers so that you don't end up at that place again. Perhaps set barriers with other people so that they don't control you or, well, not that anyone can ever control you. It's all you. You're the one who's in control, of course, but I suppose, I mean, feeling that way. How do you prevent that feeling from coming back? Um, not needing to rationalize, just saying no. Often, and it comes back to those sensations. You know, there's someone recently in my life who I realized over time that didn't need to be in my life. And I was kind of accommodating that relationship. And like, and I wasn't sure why I was. And I had to tell them, you know, they, you know, they popped back into my life. And I was like, hey, you know what? I'm not a huge fan of this. I said it to myself. I didn't say that to them. Um, but I, I took a second to notice um, how it made me feel in my body to be talking with this person again. And I was like, you know what? This really does absolutely nothing for me. And it's more anxiety provoking because that's what I'm feeling right now more than anything else. And I know what it feels like um, when relationships don't feel like that. I have, a, I have very good uh, relationships that make me feel very different. So I knew in that moment that I needed to just say no and not have to rationalize. And, um, and I did, I was like, Hey, you know what? Um, this relationship doesn't serve me. And, you know, I, I'm allowed to have expectations of friendships and it's okay if you don't want to adhere by them or if you don't want to accept them, like 100%, like there's, you don't owe me anything and nor do I, like I don't owe you anything either. Um, so being able to just say no without rationalization was, was huge. You know, I think we, we always have, feel like we need to explain ourselves to justify, you know, our boundaries when, um, when in reality, we, we don't really in, in every situation, you know, sometimes it may call for, cause like I said, it's not, it, things in life are never black and white. But if you feel like you don't want to justify, that's probably a good, a good, um, a good indicator that you probably don't need to. <laughs> so kind of just noticing that and just staying, because it wasn't comfortable. It was a very hard conversation to have, but staying with that discomfort and not moving away from it, not avoiding it and just staying with it and being like, you know what, it's okay for me to say no was huge. Because that was a huge um, win for all the work that I had been doing because that's because of who I felt I needed to be in the past probably wouldn't have said no. And to be able to notice wanting to say no and then following through despite the discomfort was huge. And I think a lot of the reasons why we feel like crap all the time is because we don't know how to say no or feel like we can't, you know, so uh, like and it goes back to again to enduring. You know, instead of just being like, hey, this this actually doesn't honor my pleasure process in any kind of way, I prefer to life differently, you know? So it's all it's all linked. It all kind of just snowballs one all over after the other. <laughs> so Okay, I I had interrupted you with questions, but I do also want to hear about what you consider to be your biggest accomplishment. Um, probably that. I think my biggest accomplishment is feeling like I deserve to do the work um, on myself personally. And then my and then being able to say like, hey, you know what, I think I could be really helpful to the people around me as well. And, you know, grad school is not comfortable or necessarily fun. It can be, but sometimes it isn't. And being able to push through that through that and then be in, in the field now, that's that's a huge accomplishment for me especially with how my undergrad went. So as in, you know, finishing and not wanting to do any of it. So finishing something and being like, I can't wait to do this. That's, that's a huge win for me. So yeah, just like the work that I'm doing now professionally and personally is a huge, huge accomplishment for me for sure. Yeah. Like we also tend to consider accomplishments to be this very tangible thing or mm -hmm. like a one moment in time kind of thing but mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like your both your your challenge and your accomplishment were ongoing processes you know they didn't happen mm -hmm. overnight 
Oh, and it's still happening now, like 100%. <laughs> okay, now we're going to get into some closing questions. And the first one I have for you is what are some routines or healthy habits that make you feel like your best self? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a huge fan of rituals. And I think routines are really good in the sense that like, it's another great way to honor our pleasure processes. Um, it doesn't really matter when, but it, I think it's really important for us to have um, rituals, whatever that may look like. It may not be the typical like, oh, this is my morning routine, like, do this and you'll have like, the, no, it's, it's not anything like that. It's just kind of noticing like, like for me, I actually made a post about this on Instagram recently, just, you know, the importance of rituals and whatever they may look like for you, but just making sure you have them. Um, because if you, if you are in, in a place where you feel like you're enduring, having a ritual that helps you feel the opposite is so important for your nervous system. And for me, um, you know, waking up in the morning and not jumping out of bed is a very important rich part of my ritual of like, um, of getting up in the morning, you know, when we start our day, it's, it's huge and jumping out. We don't give our, we don't give our nervous systems time to orient to being awake again. And, um, by doing that, you know, we can, I, I, just by lying, like waking up and lying in bed, you know, I, um, I have, you know, I, I got rid of my alarms and I, and I got an alarm that just buzzes on my wrist. So it's not as jarring. And with that, I'm able to just be like, okay, so we're awake now. And, you know, being with my dog a little bit in the morning, this, and it doesn't even, it's not even that long. It's like, it's just like five minutes where I'm lying there and being like, okay, so we're awake and, you know, we're doing life now. And, um, just not getting caught up in like all the things that I need to do. It's just, okay, this is my time to just notice how it is to be awake. Notice if I am feeling anxiety, if it is that whole, like, oh my goodness, I'm getting caught up in what I need to do today. Um, bringing in tools to kind of help me regulate and like offer myself some self-compassion. Like, yeah, we have a lot of stuff to do today. So when we get up and, you know, after we make breakfast, then we're going to make a to-do list. It's almost like I'm making agreements with myself to say, like, it's okay that you feel, you know, overwhelmed. We're going to work together to make sure that it doesn't have to be as overwhelming as it may be in my head. Because the narrative, you know, is catastrophizing. And it makes sense because it wants to sure that I get everything done and it wants to motivate me. Um but I don't need to motivate myself like that. So being able to just orient in the morning um, is like a huge um, healthy habit that I've been able to implement. Um, and it makes a it honestly really does make a huge difference for me um, in the sense that I'm able to implement my self-compassion practice even then, like so early in the morning. <laughs> but I think like healthy, like healthy habits can be so objective. Like um, a lot of times I just recommend to my clients, you know, Noticing sensations are healthy habits and nourishing your body, whatever that may look like. Um, like I have a lot of clients who, who have depression. So getting up in the morning and like doing a million things is actually not possible. They have very limited energy. So sometimes all they can do in a day is get up and have a shower and then like sit on their balcony in order to like get outside. And that means microwave meals, right? And so, you know, by the, by the, def, by definition from the wellness community, a microwave meal is not healthy, but that day was probably the healthiest day that they've had because they were able to get into the shower, right? Whereas maybe in the past, um, they would just f feel so overwhelmed, like, oh, I need to like get up, I need to shower, I need to make food, I need to do, and, and then they would end up doing nothing. But they've now been able to give themselves permission, like, Hey, no, like this is what's sustainable for me today. And, and that's okay. So it all goes back to those noticing those sensations, um, and giving yourself permission to do just that, to, to do the things that feel sustainable in that day. I think that's, that's a very important, healthy habit. But with that, you know, I always, I always encourage movement, whatever that looks like. Sometimes, you know, 
depending on the client, even for myself, that's just like, you know, I, I recommended to one client just walk around your building because that gets them outside and don't, and they're not exactly on like a time restraint or a time crunch, even like a YouTube video or whatever it is. Like it really does not matter. Um, but just movement in some regard is of course like super ben- beneficial. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, like, <laughs> It's not, it's not the most conventional answer, but I, I really just, um, there's just, like I said, there's just so much gray. Like it's, it's, it's so individual. Like there's so many factors and health is so multi-layered, um, and multifaceted. Like it just requires a lot of context and just permission to just follow whatever your authentic self needs. Um, and just being okay with that, you know? So, yeah. I hope that answers your question. (laughs) Yeah, it does answer my question in the most beautiful way. I really like the way you described how healthy habits are different for everyone. Basically, what's healthy for one person is not healthy for someone else. And everyone needs to find what works for them. I think the main thing behind incorporating a habit or a routine that you've mentioned is to be mindful. And once you find that mindful routine or habit, it just helps reinforce your authentic self. And then you can carry that mindfulness throughout the day and take that mindset and apply it to anything that you encounter, which is the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. And I mean, like, like I said, like these kinds of things are practices. Like I'm not good. Like, of course, there's, there's days that I jump out of bed, like things happen, right? But having tools in place like self-compassion and things like that it gives you permission to like to not berate yourself in those instances like shoot I didn't like lie in bed like I usually do and whatever and I just like my whole day's messed up it's just like some days are just different <laughs> and that's okay you know it, it it's not always going to be perfect um and that's okay and that, that's why these things are practices like no one's ever you know, perfectly balanced. I don't even really believe balance, but I think we've talked about this before where like, I, like, I I really don't believe in balance. I believe in, in, in sustainability, you know, um, because sometimes things take more priority over others and that's okay. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, so it's every, for me, I always remind my clients, I always remind myself, you know, the people, like the people in my personal life, it's just, you don't have to get it right all the time. You know, you learn these things so that you have them in your toolkit so that you can, you know, practice these, you know, quote unquote, good things um, more often than not. But they're also in place so that when things go a little bit differently or not according to, you know, I guess, plan, it's okay, right? And giving yourself permission to do life however it comes up, you know? So, yeah. Everything is just, it's just a practice. It really is. It's not even about, you know, getting it right all the time. It never is. That's too much pressure and I I don't care for it at all. (laughs) What has been the best piece of advice that anyone has ever given you? I've got so many good nuggets recently too. Um, And how how do I pick one? The one that kind of, um, I think... I don't know if it's like like a cookie cutter piece of advice, but just um, you know, a lot of the work that I've been doing, you know, with my therapist and even with my mentor, it all kind of surrounds, you know, you don't have to stay in a bo- in a box. You don't have to be what people expect you to be, um, and it's okay. Like it's like the the greatest piece of advice more than anything else is that it's okay to just be you whatever that looks like, even if it's changing every day, like you deserve to be here, your voice matters. And um, I think that's, that's been like a huge thing for me. It's hard to wrap your head around. And I mean, I'm still working through really embodying that. But um, the more reminders, the better that um, everyone like deserves to be exactly who they are. And it's unfortunate when we like need to, you know, be otherwise, you know? So, yeah, I think, I think it would probably be that. Who has been your biggest inspiration? Oh my goodness. Hands down, Patricia Berenson. 
She is like the queen of my life. <laughs> Patricia Berenson is my mentor. She's also like, I also work for her in her private practice. Um, she was my practicum supervisor. I have worked with her, worked with her for the past um, almost year. Just like the most amazing lady I've like, like ever met. Uh, she's been in, uh, she's been practicing for like 30 years. She's so experienced. Her insight is just, it just boggles my mind. Yeah. I've learned so much from her. I'm always learning from her. I'm um, just like, just amazing woman. Been through a lot. So it's, it's, um, it's nice to, to connect with people that have experienced adversity and have come out the other side. Um, and are still so open hearted and authentic. It's, it's so beautiful to see and to learn from her. It's, I am so like undyingly grateful to, to work with her and learn from her for as long as I have at like, and to continue to be able to do that. She's an amazing lady. She sounds like an amazing mentor. I'm so glad for you. Mm -hmm. The next question I have is, what is something that people would probably not expect that you'd be into? Um, oh man, that's hard. I feel like I, like I, it, uh, I think I could kind of think the stuff that I'd like into is just normal. So I wouldn't think that it's like unexpected to be into. Um, but, um, I guess like how we originally connected, uh, Melanie was like through like hormone stuff. So I guess that's like, maybe that's not unexpected that I'm into. Um, but maybe now since like uh, my online presence has changed, maybe it's like, interesting that I would be into um, hormone stuff. Oh, are you still into cycle syncing? Do you talk about that with your clients or with friends or anything? Oh, no, no, I'm not into it anymore. Uh, that's like a whole other podcast though. <laughs> um, uh, how that changed, uh, for me, it's been, that's been a, another huge part of the work that I've been doing. Um, but I still find it interesting. Like the, like the science is obviously still relevant. Um, so I still have a huge appreciation for it, but how would I implement it in my life is completely different. So I guess like that's something, but I guess if people, know me that's probably not unknown so it's not different than I would be into that um yeah I don't know I I still really love like I'm still like a barista at heart I love making elixirs still with all like mushroom magic and all that stuff so I guess like I'm like a secret barista my own personally <laughs> personal secret barista OMG, yes. I feel like as millennials, that's a very common job field that <laughs> so many of us have gone into. And I have yet to have a barista job, but oh, same. so it's kind of like this little idea inside of us probably like, hmm, I think, uh, think we need to try our hand at that, like just for mm -hmm. a day at least to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. say we've done it. <laughs> I'm always practicing like latte art and stuff at home because I really just want to be able to like have somebody come over and then just like have this like beautiful lot and you're like how did you do that lots of practice <laughs> so I guess there's that I'm into I like I guess I'm like super into um like superhero stuff like that like my husband and I are always watching all the superhero movies like opening night and stuff like that's just something that I like I super love I like those. You're giving me multiple answers. I like those. <laughs> yeah, you just see the best one, whichever one works, right? <laughs> I'm keeping them all in. Those are all <laughs> If you were stranded on a deserted island, what would be one thing that you would want to take with you? Oh, man. Uh, to be honest, I don't... Oh, man, that's so hard, Melanie. Come on, man. You're killing me. Uh... <laughs> Uh, probably my initial thought was to bring my Kindle because then I wouldn't have to just pick one book. I could bring like lots of, lots of books with me. <laughs> so probably that, probably my Kindle. So I could at least be really well read, <laughs> but that would also require me to bring in like some sort of like charging thing. So then I'm kind of like out of luck there too. So 
so we'll just pretend this desert island has electricity. <laughs> yeah, let's not think about that. <laughs> Okay, what is a, a book or a podcast, a movie, or um, any sort of resource that you would recommend that you feel has inspired you and would want other people to check out? Uh, I love uh, Waking the Tiger by P Peter Levine. He's the one who created Somatic Experiencing. However, he did write a book that was for the lay person. Um, called Healing Trauma. So I would totally recommend that for people who are interested in somatic experiencing or just like healing trauma in general, what that kind of looks like to read that book. Because everyone should be informed, you know, be informed consumers in regards to if you do want to, you know, if you want to do want to get into therapy, knowing the kind of practitioner you want to work with, kinds, what kinds of questions to ask, just to make sure you're getting exactly what works for you because um, that's the great thing about therapy. There's so many different kinds of therapists out there. And, and if not, you, you have the, um, and not have to choose somebody else that maybe is a better fit, you know? So yeah, just kind of informing yourself on the kind of therapy that you want and the kind of person you want to work with. So yeah. Healing trauma by Peter Levine. Okay. Everyone needs to check that book out for sure. Mm hmm. And with that, we are now at the end of the episode. I want to say thank you so much, Andrea, for coming on to the Make It Happen podcast. It's been such a joy talking with you, and you shared so much therapeutic insight and words of wisdom. It's all been super informative, and I'm sure everyone's going to love it just as much as I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and learning from you myself. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for calling me or like asking me because it's, it's cool to be able to kind of talk about this kind of thing with people. So I super appreciate you asking me. Super, super cool of you. I will catch you later then. Bye, Andrea. Yeah. Nice to talk to you, Melanie. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. How did you guys like that episode? When speaking with Andrea, I can't help but feel like she just lives with such ease because of her mindful and compassionate approach to life, which perhaps you might think is due to her psychotherapy training, but I'm pretty sure those are just qualities inherent in her personality naturally. After recording this episode, I also took a page from her book and started trying to wake up a little bit more slowly. The way she said that she'll just hang out in bed for a little bit instead of hopping out right away. Yeah, I feel like that makes such a huge difference. More times than not, I'm a hop out of bed kind of person. But lately, when I've been allowing myself those extra few minutes to just transition from sleep to waking up, it makes a big difference. If I start my day calmly, then I'm in that frame of mind and can better maintain that sense of calm throughout the day. If you get any takeaways from this episode, be sure to tell me what they are over on Instagram. I really want to hear what your favorite part of the episode is. It would also be extremely beneficial if you could share this episode with one other person who you think might enjoy it. All right, that's the end. I hope you guys are liking it so far. Please leave a review and rating on iTunes. A rating and review is really helpful to let me know what content resonates with you and also helps other people find the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye!